coming up on Network Africa. The people of Mali pay tribute to former leader Ibrahim Mubaka Keita. Meantime, keeping with ECOWAS sanctions on Mali, the UN mission there suspends flights temporarily. Plus, Uganda undergoing fuel crisis following buildup of fuel transporters at major border points. Welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Let's begin with a look at stories that made headlines over the weekend. On Sunday, family of former Malian President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita announced that he's died at the age of 76. Family members said he died in his home. They, however, did not disclose the cause of his death. Keita had been president from September 2013, but was ousted in a coup in August 2020. Shortly after, he suffered a mini-stroke the following month and was sent to the United Arab Emirates for treatment. Thousands of people demonstrated in the Malian capital Bamako against sanctions imposed by neighboring countries on the transitional military government for trying to extend its hold on power. People poured into the Independence Square, holding up signs saying, Down with Echoes and down with France to protest restrictions imposed by the economic community of West African states and supported by former colonial masters France. A military junta seized power in a 2020 coup and initially agreed to hold elections this February. It has since backtracked and recently proposed a new date of December 2025. More than 1,000 protesters trying to reach central Tunis to demonstrate against the president in defiance of COVID restrictions were dispersed by Tunisian police. Heavy police presence prevented many protesters gathering in Habib Bourguiba Avenue, the main street in central Tunis that is the traditional focal point of demonstrations, including during the 2011 revolution that brought democracy. Witnesses say police tried to disperse several different groups of protests, at least one of which had hundreds of demonstrators kicking and pushing them to force them back. The Interior Ministry said 1,200 people had protested and said its forces had exercised restraint. Sudanese security forces fired tear gas at demonstrators in the capital Khartoum as protesters rallied against military rule. Medics and police say at least one protester and one police officer were killed and dozens of people injured during another day of demonstrations against the military rule in Sudan. Huge crowds have regularly taken to the streets demanding a return to civilian rule since a coup on October 25th. The coup ended a power sharing arrangement that began in 2019. Zimbabwe's president, Emerson Nangangwa, has handed over power to the vice president for three weeks. This comes as the president begins his annual leave on Friday. The information ministry tweeted the statement from the government handle. The president's vacation runs till the 5th of February 2022. In the meantime, Vice President Constantino Chiwenga will be acting as president during this period. We'll continue with an update on the death of former Mali's uh, president, uh, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, on Sunday. As we reported earlier, family members said he died at home after being ill for a long time. Across the country, citizens have been paying tribute to the former president, even though Mr. Keita's role had been riddled with a lot of controversies and criticism, especially from the opposition, before he was toppled through a coup in 2020. Before the coup, he'd been struggling with protests fueled by his handling of a jihadist insurgency and failure to turn Mali's floundering economy. However, people have been describing him as a man of peace and a man of his word. Some said his death came as a shock. Others prayed that God uh, would rest, pray to God to rest, that he rests in peace, as he was a man who did what he could for the country, even if he did not finish his mandate. 
Another said he had given himself for his country and had made efforts despite the ingratitude to him. Keita was sworn in before, sworn into office in September 2013, but was ousted in August 2020. He had been two years into his second five-year term when he faced widespread street protests against his government and was toppled by the military, which is now under sanctions from ECOWAS for failing to restore civilian rule. And speaking of ECOWAS' latest sanctions on Mali, the UN says its peacekeeping mission in the country has temporarily suspended flights. A move is expected to hamper delivery of aid to the country as neighboring countries comply with ECOWAS' directive to close land and air borders to Mali amidst other restrictions. MINUSMA flights were abruptly grounded on Sunday night in what an email staff said was a temporary suspension. The email says staff will be informed as soon as the mission receives clearance from the government authorities to resume flights. After Air France, after France began pardon, back the echo of sanctions, national carrier Air France also suspended service to Mali. MINUSMA normally operates flights within Mali in between Bamako and Mali Central and Northern cities where there are several MINUSMA bases. Let's discuss with better minds now. Joining me now is Executive Director, West African Network for Peace Building. Mr. Chukwemeka is there. He joins me from Accra, Ghana. Chukwemeka, thank you for joining me on the program and great to see you in 2022. That move by the UN, it could further hurt regional security, wouldn't it? Well, I think it, it, it may to a very large extent, and that is um, our concerns. Um, with what has happened, what it means is that the French will withdraw its troops from Mali, and this could jeopardize a collective commitment to fighting terrorism and violent extremism, and even limit external security assistance, uh, which is key to enhancing the combat uh, and the effectiveness of the defense and security forces of Mali. So it's a huge concern, not just for Mali, but also for the Sahel region and the uh, entire West Africa region. And do your concerns also extend to how ECOWAS' recent sanctions could backfire on regional security despite Mali being ruled by military leaders? Well, it, there are a, a bit of positives and negatives um, uh, given the already deep uh, complexities of humanitarian challenges uh, facing Mali. Uh, the ECOWAS sanction could potentially aggravate the humanitarian crisis in the, in the, in the country and the Sahel as well, um, uh, especially in the areas of food security, issues around health, even with the uh, 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 COVID pandemic issues, the economic issues, uh, given the fact that ECOWAS is, is cutting off uh, every tie, including closing borders, um, also issues um, around uh, humanitarian assistance that is needed to even assuage the sufferings of the displaced population. So all this will go in the negative and could even further compound the already very difficult situation in, in, in the country. And the sanction could also have security implication for the entire region, given that Mali is the epicenter of the crisis in the Sahel and a strategic transit point for, for armed groups operating in the North Africa and the Sahel region of West Africa. Yeah, and, and those are legitimate concerns and legitimate issues. And I remember that the military leader, Asimi Goita, did point this out, you know, um, when uh, the ECOWAS announced uh, the sanctions, saying, you know, ECOWAS needs to consider, you know, some of the issues of uh, health crisis, especially the COVID-19 pandemic, and, uh, of course, security. Mm -hmm. But the interim government wants to stay on for five years, so they said they want to stabilize the country. But which is most unsettling at this point? The possibility that the military have no intentions of handing over power, or that Malins would initially cheered on the takeover in 2020, realizing, uh, realizing much later, eventually their freedoms could be taken away from them, as we have seen with most military governments. I visited Mali in December and I had extensive discussion with the uh, first vice president of the transition government. And uh, part of the issues that he raised, um, I wouldn't say they are illegitimate, but ECOWAS um, has its own protocols and it has its own normative frameworks that guides its operations. 
So the issue then is, will ECOWAS continue to listen to those excuses, uh, no matter how tangible they could uh, appear, or should they also now be more firm on its uh, extant protocols? So the sanction for me shows ECOWAS commitment to protecting the hard-earned democratic progress that we have made in the region over the past three decades against resurgence of literal Q in the political landscape. More importantly, it also provides an avenue for ECOWAS to reflect and also rethink its conflict management strategies, including the overdue protocol review of the protocol on democracy and good governance to, to expressly include issues around term limits, issues around now reinforce issues around the uh, uh, unconstitutional changes or takeover of, uh, of, of government. You know, but again, I appreciate the fact that the sanction could prolong the transition process due to the disruption in the mediation processes and potential impacts uh, of, the, of the sanction in general. More importantly, is the sanction is also occurring within the context of heightened anti-French sentiments in the country, causing nationalistic uh, sentiments against ECOWAS by painting the regional body as an outsider oppressor uh, that is being used by external powers. So, so all this, if you put it uh, within the context, then you understand and appreciate more the complexities of, of the issues we find ourselves in. Yeah, indeed. And, and you know, um, when you watch those videos of uh, people, you know, storming the streets and cheering on the military during uh, the takeover, they're, they're quite disturbing when you, I mean, if you have watched, you know, other countries also delve into uh, a serious political crisis because of uh, military governance. You're working behind the scenes, we understand. Um, what else is WANAP doing, uh, you know, to ensure that what's going on in Mali does not develop into a full-blown crisis? Well, we are, we are as a, a civil society official partner to ECOWAS on issues around peace and security. We are working with ECOWAS to um, provide our own support with regards to the, the transition processes and also mediation. We are also working with the women uh, and youth of Mali to ensure that they participate fully in the transition processes uh, and also to ensure that those women who are eager to contribute to national development are not left out in the transition process. But more importantly, to have what we may consider to be a way forward, uh, even within the complex situation that both ECOWAS and the transition government in Mali finds itself. It is not enough to continue to say that the reason why you're not going through election is because uh, the insurgents are uh, approaching Bamako. I think what is important is to have a clear roadmap that will convince both ECOWAS and the international community that indeed the military junta is ready to relinquish really power through democratic uh, uh, elections. Indeed, and we have to watch, just as ECOWAS is watching, and everyone else is watching what's going on in Mali. Chukwemeka, thank you again for joining me on the program. My pleasure, always. Thank you. Here in Nigeria, the Electoral Act Amendment Bill has been a subject of intense debate, especially with President Muhammadu Buhari withholding assent to it. So panelists at the Citizens' Town Hall on the Electoral Bill, organized by a civil society organization, Yaga Africa, a former chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Tahiru Jega, says more problems may be created if the direct primary mode is made compulsory for political parties, while Governor Abdullahi Sule of Nasarawa State says state governors and not against the option of direct primaries for conducting elections. Report or carry out our report. Three 99 days to the 2023 general election. Members of civil society groups are gathered here to continue their push for the speedy conclusion of the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. The coalition of civil society groups led by Yaga Africa had listed 10 key clauses that should be amended to guarantee the integrity of the election. These issues dominated the conversation at the citizens' town hall, especially the clause that relates to the conduct of primaries by political parties. Why are you saying the governors are against direct, governors are against indirect? It is totally false. The governors are just saying that provide an option, don't box ourselves into saying 
only one option. In case something comes up that that option is not possible, are we going to go back to the constitution or are we going to have some constitutional issues? So that's it. This country will be better off if we go into the next election with a new electoral law uh, which would enhance the integrity of the preparations and conduct of elections. Some of the panelists joined the session virtually. Prominent among them are the spokespersons of the Senate and the House of Representatives. However, the conversation took a different turn when the lawmakers were asked about the errors and contradictions highlighted by civil society organizations in the rejected Electoral Act Amendment Bill. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there won't be much time. There won't be much time to go through all the 17 errors at this sitting. What we are, what we are concerned with. Which, which Senator, person are you using? Is it the person of Yaga or the person that is with the National Assembly? Senator, there must be a, there must be, there must be a reference cup. Senator, you cannot come on national television and undermine the institution of National Assembly without fact and figure. So I challenge you. Which copy are you using? Is it copy or is it five copy of an NGO or the copy with the National Assembly? The same, or the copy co the same copy that was made that was public. Be a it's become a public be a document now point. and we've been able to scrutinize it. It's not public document. It's a public fact against you, Senator. You may disagree with it. Who issued it to be the public document? Yes, I think Senator. It's a serious matter that I have to take it up. I must commend the civil society organization who have been making efforts to make sure that uh, we see things from their own direction. Um, on the 29th of December, I received a letter from Yaga with regards to uh, some of the errors. We're talking about clause 24, sub 4, clause 50, sub 2, clause 64, uh, uh, 7 and 8, sub 7 and 8, clause 91, sub 2, clause 107, sub 3, clause 137, sub 3, you know, uh, sub heads, paragraphs 4, 5, 6, paragraph 10, sub 2, paragraph 14, 2, paragraph 16, 3, and all the rest of them. We are partners in this Nigerian project. So what we have done, immediately I send it to the speaker to look at. The conversation is holding a few days to the resumption of legislative sit-in for the year. Civil society groups are hoping that federal lawmakers can address the concerns raised by the president in the bill ahead of the off-season elections in the FCT, Oshun, and Ikiti states. Still ahead of the program. Tanzania and Burundi sign agreement for construction of 282 kilometers standard gauge railway. Well, us again. Welcome back to the program. A report from the UK's Times newspaper is quoting government sources as saying plans are being drawn up to send hundreds of migrants to countries such as Ghana and Rwanda for processing and resettlement. According to the Times, this is one of the populist policies being drawn up to help save Prime Minister Boris Johnson's embattled leadership after he admitted attending a party during the coronavirus lockdown, which he had previously denied. The Times says ministers are willing to pay hundreds of millions of pounds a year to any nation willing to take up its offer, although none has done so. In another development, police in Ghana have rescued a baby trapped in a vehicle that was stolen by gunmen from a church in Kumasi, Ashanti region. A hunting for the suspected thieves who later abandoned the car and escaped after police patrol team chased after them. The incident was posted on social media by a person, a person local media believed to be the baby's father. The baby was found in a safe condition and has since been reunited with the mother. It's not clear now how the baby ended up being alone in the car with the suspected thieves. Authorities have called on the general public to provide any information to help arrest the suspects. Tanzania and Burundi have signed an agreement to build a $900 million railway that will connect the neighboring East African nations. The two sides signed a memorandum of understanding to construct a 282-kilometer line from the western Tanzania to Burundi's capital, Gitega. Burundi remains a strategic partner to, of Tanzania in many areas, particularly trade. Tanzania has also been a strategic partner in mediating the political tensions in the country. Over in Kenya, police have termed alarmist a viral video of school kids lying down in a classroom 
to avoid gunfire. This evening, as tension remains high in Kenya's North Rift region along the Kerio Valley, where a series of banditry attacks have been happening for several months. A video posted on social media shows students frantically seeking to hide under desks, tables and chairs as shots ring out. Security leaders in the area say the attack was happening more than one kilometer away from the school. In the meantime, Kenya's National Union of Teachers has threatened to tell its members not to set foot into schools until their safety is guaranteed by the state. The government last week said it would deploy two police officers to each school in the affected area to help guard teachers and pupils. Let's turn to Uganda now, which is undergoing a fuel crisis following a buildup of fuel transporters at the major border points of Malaba and Busia in the country's east. Reports say queues of waiting trucks as long as 70 kilometers exist. Truck drivers in the region have been protesting against the requirement by the Ugandan government that they test for COVID-19 at border points, regardless of whether they presented a negative PCR test or not. Fuel prices have been steadily rising since last year, but a major spike has been seen in the past week because of the strike. In the capital Kampala, some filling stations have been selling only the premium petrol, known as V-Power, by some distributors, which costs 5,200 Ugandan shillings, which is $1.05 uh, per litre at some outlets. Investigative journalist with NBS at TV, Canary Mugume, joins me now from Kampala. Canary, thank you for making time to be with us today. Why are the truck drivers so unwilling to do the tests? Thanks for having me. Well, the truck drivers are saying that these mandatory tests are not only expensive, uh, but also they take a lot of time and therefore create long queues along the border and creates so many delays in the process. Then what's the government doing about this? Um, I mean, if they want the truck drivers to do the test, they have to give them some concession, right? Yeah, absolutely. And for, for now, what we know is that uh, the mandatory testing has been, you know, suspended at the Malaba Busia land borders. Uh, this is the border between Kenya and Uganda to uh, ease the traffic flow. Uh, we saw a later that was coming in from the Ministry of Health that uh, decided to immediately temporarily suspend the mandatory testing, testing of COVID-19 between the two borders. Now, the truck drivers, um, even though um, uh, the, 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 the testing has been waived, um, the prices in Uganda are still high, which means that they still have a long way to move from the border to bring the fuel inside the country. Yeah, and those queues at the border are as long as 70 kilometers, so a lot of time will have to go by before things return to normal. How much longer do they intend then to carry on with the process, or have they called that off? Well, what we hear is that uh, it, it's just going to be um, one week, the, the, the suspension of, of the temporary, of the mandatory testing. Um, what we're not sure of is, so if this was just a temporary um, suspension of the testing of COVID-19, what happens after one week? Uh, does government really have a plan on how to, you know, deal with this situation? Um, we don't want to go back to, you know, the uh, fuel prices we're in if they actually go down um, after about a week. So the, 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 the Kenyan Transporters Association has also um, threatened to suspend the hauling of the cargo until the Ugandan government fully, fully reconsiders on this directive, which they considered costly. So there is also need of the two governments to just sit down on a round table and agree on what way forward to go on. But as for now, the truck drivers will remain uh, protesting this move until there's a final conclusion. And I imagine the people must be complaining. 5,200 Ugandan shillings is no joke uh, for a lot of people, in, especially in the capital. So how are they coping with the fuel shortage? So there's a bit of a problem. Um, some some people have seen you know posts on social media saying that they had to actually leave their cars home uh, because you know if you are used to fueling your car with certain liters of fuel to drive you a certain specific distance and now that distance has to reduce because of the fuel prices it means that um, you know some of the activities have to be hindered and therefore they're not really really uh, happy about this move they're just you know appealing to the government. The government, through the uh, the accounting officer of the finance ministry, he did put out a tweet and said that 
the prices will come down soon. What the question is here now is how soon is soon? Yeah, indeed. How soon is soon? Canary, thank you for joining us on the program. Thanks for having me. That's Network Africa today. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Obani.